Gracias, Susana. Um, okay, as Susana has said, this is the first of a number of papers, all of them included in two panels that deal with basically Thomas More, that 16th century English uh, author um, who was so influential in Europe at the time and who also had an impact in Spain. So we are trying in this project, as Susana said, uh, Dr. Oliveira said, uh, uh, he had an influence on a number of ideas. Uh, and, and there's a number of angles through which we can study Thomas More. One I'm going to, to, to examine is one which is not so frequently uh, studied because I believe that in our field, English studies and uh, humanities, this is considered to be not so interesting or perhaps uh, a bit far from our preoccupations, huh? uh, which is economy. So I'm going to talk about economy, huh? at least one specific element. Huh? Uh, although it has not been frequently noted, any examination of Thomas More's Utopia as you know, Utopia was written in Latin, originally in Latin in 1516, and then translated into English in, in uh, 1551, uh, especially book one, the first book of, the, of, the, of Utopia, cannot fail to perceive the text's concern with an alarming increase in prices in 16th century England. The Portuguese sailor and main character, Raphael Hifloday, discusses in the Dialogue of Council the existence of prices on the rise in the island of Utopia. He says, this enclosing has had the effect of raising the price of grain in many places. In addition, the price of raw wool has risen so much that poor people who used to make cloth are no longer able to buy it. But even if the number of sheep should increase greatly, their price will not fall a penny. <clears throat> Although Thomas More's most celebrated text, Utopia, abounds in this kind of direct and also indirect references and observations on economy and wealth, criticism of More's major work has seldom paid sufficient attention to these elements. At least this is what I believe. However, I am persuaded that More's writings manifest a clear preoccupation with the economic changes that he seemed to perceive already in the second decade of the 16th century. Interestingly, most of these problems, or most of these ideas, were also troubling not only Moore's England, or even his island of Utopia, but also Habsburg Spain, under Charles V, and indeed most of Western Europe. To be sure, and despite the scarcity of economic approaches to Moore's work, the amount of issues of a deep economic nature we may find in Morian writings, Utopia especially, but not exclusively, is overwhelming. Indeed, such concepts as, and I will make just a short list, the nature of money and gold, inflation, bullionism and mercantilism, debasement and monetary regulation, engrossing and enclosures, the function of money and monetarism, usury and credit, taxation, the level of prices and wages, profit, and the balance of trade and of payments, and this is not an exhaustive list, all these, I think, should occupy some space in Morian studies. Sadly, they barely do. As any cursory look at any specialized publication on Thomas More or English literature of the Tudor period will confirm. Actually, you can find articles dealing with economy in Thomas More, but they are mostly written by economic historians, not by English scholars. Huh? In this paper, I do, in, I do not intend, far from it, to address all or even a few of these issues. Rather, I aim to modestly examine how Thomas More's Utopia articulates just one of these economic problems, a big one with such relevance and complexity that it seems, I think, to encompass various other related economic processes. This economic phenomenon is the sustained increase in prices for over 200 years that economic historians have come to know as the price revolution. In very simple terms, this economic disturbance, the price revolution, 
consisted of a generalized and sustained sharp rise in prices that took place all over Western Europe between 1470, roughly speaking, and 1650. It followed what had been a sustained period of economic stability, since, as it is well known, the European 15th century, the 1400s, had experienced an age-long economic equilibrium of prices and wages. This involved the generalized belief that there was a just level for both salaries and prices, what uh, people call a fair price, and that this level was determined by tradition and equity, the latter concept, equity, meaning that prices were a, a direct consequence of the amount of work put into producing the particular commodities. Profit, then, in the modern Marxist surplus value sense of the word, was a suspect notion, as in common good, which is positive, versus particular profit, which is supposed to be negative. This meant that for the late medieval and early 16th century mind, any rise or slump in prices or wages should always be inevitably followed by a swift return to their traditional levels. This worldview was shattered by the tremendous dislocation introduced by the price revolution. Put in simple terms, and with all due reservations, because we, don't, we do not have anything remotely resembling a general index of Tudor prices, or a consumer price index of the early middle period, prices in England increased at 500% between 1500 and 1650. Admittedly, this is not a huge rise for our modern standards, huh? but it was considering where they came from. As a consequence of the price revolution, both the wealth of the upper classes and the numbers of the poor increased. Also, the Reformation and the frequent food riots of the 16th century have been considered more or less direct consequences of this phenomenon. Now, leaving symbolic considerations aside, important as they are, what the price revolution really amounts to is, put very simply, generalized inflation of a kind Europe had not experienced for some hundred years. How this works and to what extent it can be related to specific economic policies was explained approximately a century ago by Irving Fisher in a seminal book titled The Purchasing Power of Money. In order to explain some specific economic dislocations, specifically this one, and uh, asking the forgiveness of Sereri, because I think this is the first time that a mathematical equation will appear in a Sereri <laughs> conference, Fisher produced the quantity theory of money, QTM which sets up a proportion in which MV equals PT. In this equation, M is the total amount of money in circulation, V is the velocity at which it circulates, P is the general level of prices, and T is the total volume of transactions. If, as many economists claim, the volume of, of transactions did not rise significantly throughout this period, and also coins and bills of exchange did not circulate at a higher velocity, although this is questioned by some people, then an increase in M, the amount of money, through a massive influx of bullion, gold and silver, must inevitably produce an increase in P, in the level of prices. When such a thing happens, the result, <coughs> as in Dickens, Mr. Mikobola's famous economic recipe for happiness, is misery. Although not everywhere, not for all, and not in the same degree as Thomas More seemed to know. Focusing on England, it must be noted that economists and economic historians, then as today, have not been able to satisf satisfactorily explain why or how this happened. Some explanations attribute this phenomenon to an extraordinary influx of silver and gold from the Spanish colonies. That's why it was called uh, the Spanish uh, Price Revolution. This is the so-called treasure thesis, which can be summarized following the QTM as more bullion, more coin, higher prices. The problem is that some increases in prices do not seem to coincide with specific influxes of bullion, not for Spain and less so for England. And this makes it difficult to accept that the influx of bullion, American or European, is the sole cause of the rise in prices. Apart from the treasure or monetary thesis, debasement, another very important economic disturbance, have also been posed as the leading cause of this pervasive and destructive inflation. In short, 
prices are not rising in this theory because there is more bullion circulating, but because coins contain less bullion and it takes more coins to pay a product stable silver price. Yet, agricultural prices were steadily rising during the first two decades of the 16th century. And King Henry VIII's great debasement only took place in 1542. So this cannot be, again, the sole cause, or at least not in Moore's island of utopia. Another possible cause for the Spanish price revolution could have to do with an increase in the velocity of circulation, which, as we saw, was one, was one of the elements of Fisher's QTM. This evidenced a more dynamic society, and it led to what today we would call an overheated economy. But it remains to be assessed to what extent it was a significant phenomenon in the early 16th century. There are also, just to mention them briefly, demographic explanations which focus on the sustained population growth after the plague epidemics that hit England uh, during the 15th, 14th and 15th century. Added to this, the extension of arable land decreased and the unproductive population of the cities grew. So this is a summary, very basic, of the different possibilities that explain this rise in prices. After taking all these elements into consideration, most economic historians agree that the price revolution cannot be explained by one single cause, even if this is as powerful as the massive influx of bullion in England. Many of the effects of the price revolution had already been perceived decades before as if that a significant amount of precious metals arrived into this economy. Consequently, there must be some other complementary causes for the rising prices of the period 1470, 1530, which is the period we are interested in because this is the period in which Moore was actively uh, working and in the middle of this period, he published Utopia, or he wrote Utopia. So only multicultural explanations can account for the complexities of this economic unrest, focusing on the combined influence of growing population, increasing velocity of economic transactions, also the incipient influx of precious metals and credit money, and mostly, as I will argue, the impact of market-based regimes of accumulation, proto-capitalistic, if you like, which is the cause that Heath Lovey seems to be explaining to Cardinal Morton in Book One of the Utopia. This last factor appears to be of central relevance for the price revolution itself and in an examination of utopian economics. Inflation was originally and wrongly considered to be the consequence of the consolidating of small land holdings into larger farms. This was the standard explanation um, at, at the period. Actually, it was the official explanation held by Henry VIII's secretary, Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset, who was in charge of English, uh, English economy until 1550. But then, when John Dudley, the first Duke of Northumberland, took office, it was realized that enclosures were the consequence, not the cause, of an inflation produced by the influx of bullion and an overheated economy. So by the first quarter of the 16th century, the enclosure of the commons was still believed to be the cause of English inflation. Enclosures in practice prevented communal use of arable land, we know that, with better profit-making opportunities for the rich landowners who could secure the property rights of the land. This is what is criticized, so much criticized in the book. This revolution in the agricultural economy, to a large extent interrelated with the other elements already mentioned, eventually brought about various different perceptions of wealth and how to accumulate wealth, which are the two key elements in, in the book. In the economic treatise, Usury, Arraign, and Condemn, from 1625, 100 years after Utopia was written, the anonymous author ponders in, on the consequences of obtaining an excessive profit, and more specifically on usury, that special kind of profit-making practice that was so disturbing for the early modern mind. Usury had been traditionally condemned because, as such disparate figures as Aristotle and Luther have explained, Money must be sterile. Money must be barren. Money cannot and should not beget more money. This is what the book has to say about this. 
Now, if traders and others which have stakes in goods shall transport the same into money, to eat up by usury, such as have stakes in lands and landed men on the other side, sell their lands to eat up traders and farmers, whose stakes are in goods, do they not between them both spoil, if not grind, the poor, which depend on them for employment, yeah, and also spoil their country by devouring one another? I find this short paragraph highly significant and relevant for my discussion for three reasons. Firstly, it emphasizes, together with many other texts of the same period, the link between usury and enclosures, to which I will return later. Then, threaded throughout the text, we find a chain of arguments that in the form of causes and effects, or causes and consequences, link tradesmen with landowners and farmers, and these with the poor of the country. The author of the text manifests a concern about the safety of the weak, those who suffer from the conflict between emergent tradesmen and landowners uh, mutually eating up each other. And, the author adds, it is not only that the poor may suffer, but that the powerful and the rich, he says, spoil their country by acting this way. What is being denounced here, among other things, is what David Glynn has recently called the differential exposure to harm that characterizes early modern societies and, of course, our own society. But this piece, and this is my third interest in this quote, also introduces a most interesting image, a metaphor of consumption, a sustained organic image of eating and devouring that animalizes the effects of capitalism on people by presenting profit-making and the accumulation of wealth as an aggressive zero-sum game. As a matter of fact, this metaphor seems to have enjoyed more than moderate success, as modern economic historians have aptly described the relations of production in the 16th century as, on the one hand, the city's appetite, on the other, being satisf satisfied by the country's work. But writing in the early 17th century, the author of this work, of the usury, arraign, and condemn, can hardly claim any originality, neither in the concept explained nor in the images employed. A century earlier, in the first book of the Utopia, Raphael Hitlerbey had already explained one of the causes that made thieving necessary in England in similar terms. Your sheep, Hitlerbey says, that used to be so meek and eat so little, now they are becoming so greedy and wild that they devour men themselves, as I hear. They devastate and pillage fields, houses, and towns. In his conversation with Cardinal Morton in book one of the Utopia, Hitler Day is evidently describing a well-known legal, social, and economic phenomenon, the so-called enclosure of the commons. These man-eating sheep, devastating towns and lands, were one of the most visible effects of nascent and expanding capitalism in England. Arable lands, historically enjoyed by the common people, had been privatized in order to become grazing pasture land, grassland for livestock, owned by big landowners and aristocrats, the profit of the few displacing the benefit of the many. Again from Utopia, the nobility and the gentry, yes, and even some abbots, though otherwise holy men, are not content with the old rents that the land yielded to their predecessors. Living in idleness and luxury without doing any good to society no longer satisfies them. They have to do positive evil, for they leave no land free for the plot. They enclose every acre for pasture. They destroy houses and abolish towns. Thus, one greedy, insatiable glutton, a frightful plague to his native country, may enclose many thousand acres of land within a single hedge. Just one person can own huge land and impoverish thousands of people. These miserable people, the farmers, leave the only homes familiar to them, and they can find no place to go. Since they cannot afford to wait for a buyer, they sell for a pittance all their household goods. When that little money is gone, what remains for them but to steal? In Hitler Day's speech, in these and other similar speeches, common lands disappear and employment surges, and the states of many families are, as a consequence, sold at a loss. This critical situation is followed by crime, which Moore and Hitler, they try to excuse or even justify morally, alluding to the consequences of this process. 
Yet, what may strike the reader here, then and now, is the accurate description of the effects of what was perceived as the legitimation of the avarice of landowners and gentlemen. Furthermore, Hitler Day, and to a certain extent we may assume more himself, manifests strong disgust with this economic system in which, paradoxically, sheep eat men. To a great extent, enclosures were shorthand for the mass expropriation of English 16th century peasants and a direct consequence of usury. Since they were often motivated by the landowner's need for ready money, which was necessary to pay the usurer's interest. So it was a, a, a vicious circle. But book one of the Utopia does not simply manifest a protest against this conspiracy of the rich against the poor in a medieval Langlandian fashion. Rather, the Portuguese sailor produces an insightful examination of the economic situation of 16th century England, its causes and consequences, which he links to the price revolution. This enclosing has had the effect of raising the price of grain in many places. In addition, the price of raw wool has risen so much that poor people who used to make cloth are no longer able to buy. So great numbers are forced from work to idleness. One reason is that after the enlarging of the pasture land, rot killed a great number of sheep. But even if the number of sheep should increase greatly, their price will not fall a penny. The reason is that the wool trade, though it can be called a monopoly because it isn't in the hands of one single person, is concentrated in few hands, an, an oligopoly, you might say. And these so rich that the owners are never pressed to sell until they have a mind to, and that is only when they can get their price. Hitler Day, or perhaps the soon-to-be under-treasurer of the exchequer, Thomas More, is here describing in some detail the operations that led to the unexpected and disturbing inflation experience in the first two decades of the English 16th century. Writing within a market-based regime of accumulation, Hitler Day seems to be specifically denouncing a pricing mechanism to establish the exchange values of goods. A financial operation that we could consider a racket, that like money lending for profit or debasement seem to tamper with the human dimension that all the economic interactions used to have until then. That these operations were at least relatively new to the 16th century mind, mind can be seen in the fortune, and this is interesting, of, for a translator, of Moore's Latin terms monopolium and oligopolium, which were not translated in the first 1551 English version of Utopia, because they didn't have the word for those. To conclude, Thomas More's Utopia, and more specifically his dialogue of counsel, provides an insight into the ways in which the early modern price revolution was understood in the early 16th century, and into the transformation that, that it produced, evidently concerned with the destruction of the traditional economy and society of the early 16th century England, More's work seems to ignore the monetary thesis, or to a certain extent, the velocity of circulation a single causes for that economic disturbance. Actually, their effect would only become clear some decades later. Moore suggests instead the enclosure of the commons and the implementation of pricing mechanisms that seriously harm the interests of farmers and peasants and condemns them through the Portuguese Hilo Day as abusive forms of possession and maldistribution of property. The economic dimension of both books of the Utopia has not been fully examined yet. I am persuaded that such an analysis would show how the text is closely linked to the 16th century transformations that were caused by the so-called proto-globalization and which directly led to nascent capitalist practices in England and elsewhere. More, Thomas More, through Hitler Day and Morus, was strongly concerned about how these changes seem to involve harming the weak and he seemed eager to offer ways to minimize these damaging effects through what may be considered a compensatory fantasy of social and economic equality. As someone called Thomas Munzer in Germany would say only eight years later, omnia sunt communia. Thank you.